Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Today is April 15th, 2020. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Usholt, who I believe it's fair to say you're the father of our field, <laughs> since you were the first to publish a paper in uh, ontology engineering. So it's just a great privilege to, uh, to have you here uh, speaking about knowledge graphs in industry. Michael? Well, thank you very much. That's a very high compliment, but I can't take that honor. It was really Michael Grinninger and I who wrote the paper together. So, um, but anyway, thank you. So we are co-parents, I suppose. <coughs> anyway, um, thank you very much. And today we're gonna talk about um, kind of my many years of experience of applying ontologies and more recently building knowledge graphs and putting, putting systems into production. Um, and so with that, we'll just get going. So here's a, um, hang on. Oh, I know. There we go. Uh, so first of all, who am I? Most of you, many of you know who I am. I've been doing this for quite a long time, first in academia and then um, more last 10, 15 years in industry. Um, and build commercial ontologies in quite a lot of industries, as we'll see coming up shortly. And I also published a book on OWL recently, kind of pulling together all my experiences over the years and using OWL for international projects. Um, Semantic Arts is a company that we work for, that I work for. We're relatively small, about 20 people, about eight or 10 ontologists, and we're going quickly. And this is just a list of some of our clients that we've worked with over the years. Um, so I'm going to jump right into an example, and then we'll kind of back out and talk about different experiences and, and lessons learned and things like that. So what actually um, we do for a typical company is exemplified by this example. This We gave a talk in Data Architecture Summit October last year. Um, the company we worked with is Morgan Stanley. And so what we did was they have a lot of operational risk. Uh, any bank, any financial institution has a lot of risk about things going wrong. Um, <clears throat> and so what we did was we built an ontology to cover a lot of the subject matter related to risk. So key things are, you know, what kind of issues arise, an issue is really something that might go wrong. Um, you know, what are the risks, they have a taxonomy of risks, and then they track actual incidents that happen. So an incident is kind of like the manifestation of a, of a risk, which is a potential bad thing. Um, and then of course there's generic things, there's controls to put things into place to, to make the bad event less likely to happen. And there's generic stuff, employees and, and lots of other stuff. So we pile that all into a, a triple store and then we use it to drive a, 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 an application. Um, and the critical thing here, the third bullet there, we combine the specific task, sorry, the, the subject specific um, triples with generic triples that are pulled from different places around the organization. Um, and that's where the knowledge graph technology really comes in, because you can integrate things much more easily. So here's, uh, oh, I know. So Morgan Stanley, we've been working with them for a few years, and we've done a variety of other things in addition to just risk. So we've built out ontologies to help their equity research team. So they track things like, you know, what's what's the EBITDA and a lot of different factors, and we're representing those. They're tracking their technology assets and also information management, records management, documents, and stuff like that. So we're working with them to build out a variety of ontologies and we're building out a variety of applications. So here's the big picture of how this works. Applications driven by knowledge graphs. So we start, like many of you out there, building our ontologies using Protege. Obviously, you can use any tool that you want. Protege exports a text file. Some people, you know, use um, text editors to create their ontologies from scratch. That's fine. You do whatever you want. Um, and then we take tables, almost always they're tables, typically from databases um, export, relational databases export, spit trip export tables, trip spreadsheets basically. Um, and then you have some kind of engine to create triples. Um, you map the tables to the ontology, we'll see how that works in a moment. Um, and then you generate triples. So you generate, um, so the, you load the ontology itself, which is triples into a triple store. You load the data, um, from relational tables that goes into the triple store. And, and you may be other sources as well, XML, social media, text documents, et cetera. 
now that it gets loaded into this triple store and it's all um, uses the ontology as a scheme. Um, <clears throat> so we don't just create triple stores for fun, although it is fun. Um, the whole idea is to have it derive applications. And so this works just the way any application works. The only difference is you're running a triple store as the database instead of a relational database. Um, so you, you have a user interface, the user does stuff. Program logic says, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Send out Sparkle queries instead of SQL queries, you get results. Um, and then you just go round and round. This is nothing unusual about this. It's just essentially swapping out an SQL store with a triple base and a triple store. And there's lots of advantages why you do that. Um, one critically important thing is you can use the same schema, same ontology for multiple triple stores. So you design your ontology for employees, for software, hardware, etc. And you can also use a single triple store for multiple applications. That's just not possible with relational technology. And generally speaking, you get a lot of increased flexibility, fewer silos, all the sorts of benefits that the ontology kind of community, such as yourselves, um, are already quite familiar with. So I don't need to argue for that. But here's a question of how do we get triples from tables? Um, par pardon me if this is really basic for some of you, but I'm guessing that some others of you won't have seen this or worked with it quite like this. Um, so essentially, we get tables of this sort. This is just a trivial example. You know, corporation, so there's an identifier, and then there's a table that says, who, are my, who am I a subsidiary of? If I am a subsidiary of anybody, what's my official name, and who's my CEO? So here's just a simple little knowledge graph. We've got a schema, a legal entity, corporation, person. Then we've got the data. Um, in ontology speak, you know, we call this the T box and this the A box. Um, and so the deal is each cell in this table corresponds to a triple. So that cell corresponds to the triple that says that particular organization with identifier 3345223 has CEO, CEO with identifier layer tape. Now, of course, you wouldn't normally mint the URI that way, but I did it just for readability. So how do you get these triples from the tables? Well, there's lots of different things you can do. We started writing just programs, just using Python or Java, whatever people want. And then we moved toward more standard approaches, R2, RML, we've been using for a number of years on and off. Other homegrown tools, specialized tools that we built in-house, many, there are many of them out there. Tarkle is what we're moving, using more recently. Um, and there's a variety of new tools becoming available all the time because it's the importance of this knowledge graphs and industry is growing. Okay, so now the nice thing is you plunk all this into the same data store. With relational technology, you just get um, just the data and you don't, you can't really query the schema in the same way. So that's kind of nice. Um, and you can also federate across multiple stores. Um, and the idea of a fun thing that ontology and semantic technology makes possible is that you can have a single data store, you know, service a variety of different applications. So it's, instead of applications being the center of the universe, um, the data should be the center of the universe. So why would you do this? Why does this semantic technology help? Part of this is a, kind of an explanation of why this technology works. Um, I don't need to go into a lot of details, but just hit the, hit the high points. The biggest one is the global IRIs. Um, which enhanced data integration that we use. It just makes everything snap together very easily. Data is a bit cleaner. Uh, it's easier to, to change and, and adapt for expectations. And also um, with the ontology driven um, methodology, the ontology really focuses on the meaning. Okay, so typically people build systems focusing on the structure, um, tables in particular, and they have to build logical models, physical models, and all kinds of stuff. But we don't, and they don't really focus on the meaning. The meaning kind of gets lost. Um, and so the meaning is really important, and that's what ontologies are all about. Let's structure the subject matter so I understand what things mean. Um, and that's important because if you don't understand what's going on, you can't reuse it. And that's a really critical thing today. So we at Semantic Arts have done a wide variety of things over the last several years um, in product data and configuration. Information application integration. We recently did work with a startup. Um, they wanted to build a chatbot, and they, they thought, 
hey, let's try evening oncology. So we started modeling conversations, a taxonomy of intent. Somebody calls, they have some intention. They want to learn a particular thing or solve a particular problem. And you want to figure out what that intent is without asking them per se. You want to kind of figure that out all automatically. Um, one of the major consultancies we're working with them to do expertise modeling because so they have um, a, a client comes in and they say we need someone to do XYZ and they want to model out just who the right people are to put on that assignment. Um, and we're also doing some work with, in the gaming industry where they have lots and lots of taxonomies and they're realizing the, the limitations and they want to move toward ontologies. Um, so let's look at one very interesting case study that we did quite a few years ago now. So this is a company called Schneider Electric. Um, <clears throat> and if you look on the left-hand side, there was a, a relational table. They approached us, by the way, because they couldn't manage their products catalog anymore. There's a million products out there and, and they couldn't keep up with new products and new descriptions. It was basically a mess. And one of the things that made that challenging was for because Europe is a country with a tremendous amount of diversity and some of the countries are richer than others. So the exact same product might sell in Switzerland for you know 20 euros, but in Bulgaria it might sell for 10 euros just because that's how the market works. And if anybody figures out that it's the exact same product, then they'll just buy some in one country and sell them in the other one at a profit. What they do is they hide the fact that the exact same product underneath and they describe it differently. They'll say the rated voltage is 20 volts instead of you know 21 so it looks different but it's really the same technically it's the exact same product so they have really difficult time tracking all these products so in the upper left there we see what, what amounts to a data model and so there's different concepts there um, because electrical products are pretty much the same whoever is selling them whoever is making them there's voltages and there's sizes and dimensions and there's core ideas. Um, so what we did was we worked with them and we said, okay, let's extract out of this um, relational table of products just the information we need to represent them and as a knowledge graph based back with our ontology. Now what we are finding is usually a 10x reduction in, in size and complexity. So they might have 7,000 tables, um, which corresponds to you know 7,000 you know, classes, and we might end up with just five or 700 classes, um, a dramatic reduction. And so you reach into the table and you only pull out just the things that you need. It's usually, like I say, it's an order of magnitude reduction. <clears throat> this particular company purchased another company, as, as is often done, acquisitions. Um, and for 10 years, they sat around wondering what to do with that product catalog and could we integrate that and it just seemed so hard to do because the reality is on the left hand side the only part that they really cared about was some small percentage and over here the only part they really cared about was some small percentage because you couldn't reach in there and look and see which part mattered and which part didn't so what we did was we talked to the experts we didn't we didn't examine the data model we just talked to the experts we said tell us about products specifications um, for products, how does that even work? And then we reached in, we pulled out the triples, and then they said, hey, well, if this actually works the way you think it should, then you should be able to go to this other ontology, sorry, this other relational database, which is developed completely independently uh, on another continent, as it happens, um, and pull that out. And sure enough, because the concepts are really the same, it's just a matter of reaching in and looking. So now we have a shared ontology. So this little star and this little star in this little funny shape. This is really the exact same shape, it just looks different, you can't see it. So you can load up that ontology. So now there's a shared schema. And now you have the ability to integrate products. Um, and so this, this has been a very successful, a very successful um, effort. The ontology was relatively small, focusing on specifications, technical specifications, and it's been in production, helping them out for about five years now. Um, Another focus um, of what we've been working with clients, uh, it's a natural match for knowledge-based technology and semantic technology, is where there's uh, information providing companies. So lots of companies out there that just sell information. Um, so they sell information about companies, they sell information about industries, they sell information about who's buying what kind of products, where, um, 
commodity markets, there's companies that sell information about costs of commodities, etc. cetera. Um, hold on one moment. Sorry about that. That was some noise in the background. Okay. Um, so there's companies that sell information about pricing. You know, how much does it cost to buy aluminum in, in Australia? Um, also, faceted search is a really common theme. And more recently, we worked with a small company who has. Um, captured the global economy as a set of industries. And we'll just talk about that for a moment. Quite interesting. So the name of the company is, um, what did I say, IBB, Industry Building Blocks. What do they do? So they analyze companies in terms of what a company provides, okay? And then they analyze market areas in terms of the industries that define them. You might think there's a smartphone industry but really there's kind of sub industries within that that compete on different different levels um, so this guy manually kind of on his own with a team of people um, analyzed and has characterized 21,000 different industries in terms of who are the competitors what types of things who's buying in that industry who are the types of vendors what kind of things can substitute for other things etc so we did a little project um, just an over a matter of a few months. So the guy had, he gave us his spreadsheet and said, here's, here's the information. Most of the information that's in his spreadsheet isn't, he can't find it anywhere really. He's been just doing this on his own. So we created a simple ontology to map the common concepts um, in his spreadsheet to what was really going on, the concept of an industry, the concept of, you know, super sectors and sectors just a few months, we managed to pull in, build a small ontology, pull in some triples, run some queries. Um, and at the moment, we're building out a, 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 product, a product that we hope we'll put online and, and generate some actual revenue. So why would we, why did he approach us? Um, so he actually started reading about knowledge graphs and he thought, well, that sounds interesting. He started talking, of, talking about it to various people he knew and people who they knew. Eventually they came around and invited us to, to work with them. So why is this helping? So he's doing everything manually in his spreadsheet so we can do a lot of automation now. And once it's in this triple store, we can do data validation, things can change quickly. Um, and also instead of just having things in a spreadsheet where someone has to come to him and say, hey, can you tell me about the, um, you know, the smartphone industry in Australia? You know, he can just have, we can run, run us online and have it work automatically in the background. So that's a fun little project we've been working on. So those are just a couple of examples of what we've been doing over the years. So now I want to go over some kind of just our own experiences and recommendations and lessons learned, if you like. So here's just the four themes, the siren call of semantic silos. How does shackle fit in? Do you even want schema? Some people say yes, some people say no. And some thoughts about change management. Um, so, what we find over and over again, we go into a company, and five years ago, we were the only people doing anything semantic with ontologies, et cetera. But now, every company we go into already has somebody doing something somewhere in the company. Um, but if you just go into an, an area or a big organization and build out a semantic solution, you get some nice benefits, um, <clears throat> which is great. But somebody else, somewhere else in your organization is doing the same thing. Now you're basically just recreating the same sorts of silos that semantic technology is designed to not require to get out of. So don't just build three different RDF stores and have them sitting not working together. Don't do that. So what do you do instead? You build an enterprise ontology. So how does that work? Phase one. You first identify, these are the, the idea of competency questions that sometimes people give me the credit for that, but it's not me, it's Michael Brinninger and Fox, I forget his first name, um, in, in Toronto. So they came up with this idea of questions, competency questions. So first of all, you say, what questions do you need answers to? And that's going to be your requirements that drive what goes in the ontology. You build out the ontology, you make the triples, and then you write some Sparkle queries that can answer those questions. Then you build out applications that make use of that data in the way we saw early on in the talk. Um, 
And then what do you do? So you think, well, that's good. And, the, and the, the client will bless that and say, that's good. Yep, it answers the questions. There's two kinds of things going on there. One is they want to know that you brought in the data accurately. So they, they run their own set of questions separately using their existing technology and existing data. And then they say, okay, ask these same questions and give us a, give us an answer. And then they do checks. So, so one thing is just to verify that the questions that they're already getting answers to, we can get the exact same answers. But that's just to check that we've done things correctly. The more interesting thing is to be able to answer questions that you can't, that they can't do now, okay? Um, so once we, so then you just kind of iterate. You continue with, say, okay, so we did an initial scope, and now we're gonna broaden the scope. So in the case of the, in the industry building blocks, we started out with a very narrow set of, um, factors, but the guy has like 80 or 100 columns, and so we can just grow that bit by bit, adding more and more factors. Um, so you extend the ontology to meet the requirement, to meet the requirements. And this this bullet here, with other ontology authors and enterprise, that's extremely important. This is how you add a new feature to the ontology, and you say, well, I wonder if somebody else has already done something like this. It seems kind of generic. And if it has been done, then you work with the other people and you align things. Um, and then again, you, you do the same thing. You make the data and the ontology available as triples um, and you just keep extending and building out that way. Um, so that's how we proceed. <coughs> so let's see how this works, why having the enterprise ontology actually helps. So here's a typical scenario in a company. So you have an HR department which has employees, um, two kinds of employees, exempt employees, hourly workers, they're assigned to a particular home office, say, which is in a jurisdiction, which is a place. Um, so now we have completely independently, a different application, different data model. Users, they have access to databases that are installed on servers that are located in data centers that are located in cities. So this is a typical thing you find, but suppose you wanted to ask a question, and say, find me all the personnel. Oh, well. Where do personnel sit? Well, users are personnel, hourly workers are personnel, but these things don't mix or match. What do you do instead? Well, let's have a generic schema, which, which would be part of the enterprise ontology. And some of the things in an enterprise ontology are generic across all enterprises, like personnel and building. Some parts of the enterprise ontology will be specific to the particular industry that you're in. In this case, it's just completely generic. So you take the HR department, you link things up to generic classes. So for example, the hourly workers are both personnel and the home office is a responsive building. The IT department, you have users, which is also personnel. Data centers are also buildings and the cities are located in countries. Okay, so now there's things that collapse together. So the personnel shows up twice. So we're gonna redraw this picture so the personnel is one box instead of two, and under personnel, we'll see hourly worker, exempt employee, and user. And similarly, under building, we will see home office and data center. So the next picture is simply redrawn. So building has home office and data center, personnel has hourly worker, exempt employee, and user, um, and the rest of it is just the same. Um, so now you can ask a federated query, you can say, Tell me all the personnel. So when you build, if you do the approach that we do with the knowledge graph, you bring in the data um, for the for the IT department, and you bring in the data from the HR department. It snaps together automatically. Um, so this is the way that you avoid building yet more silos, but using silo using semantic technology. Um, now, of course, the critical thing here that makes it all work is that you have URIs for classes and URIs for properties, um, which means you can reuse the schema. With relational technology, you can, can't reuse schema, which is, which is really the reason, one of the main reasons that silos exist everywhere in every major organization. Okay, that sounds nice. Oh, great, we can just build the enterprise ontology. Well, it's a lot of work, um, but it's worth it. So who, why, why, what's difficult about this process? And we find it's very time consuming, uh, but the clients we work with are committed to doing things right instead of doing things right away. Um, so you agree on the terminology and the minting patterns, <clears throat> and you have to agree on how to evolve and extend the ontology. 
one of the challenges is um, when you're building out um, an ontology, inevitably something shows up that isn't specific to your um, particular topic at hand, but you need it, whereas it hadn't been needed before. So then it goes into, we keep that in a separate little place while we locally develop. And then those become candidates for, for promoting up to the more generic enterprise. Um, and then of course you have to manage the impacts of what, when the ontology changes. Sometimes it, it changes additively, which isn't really a problem. But sometimes you realize, oh my gosh, I have to go back and make more fundamental changes. So that's actually something that needs to be um, worked on. And then you also want to use Shackle for data validation. Um, so what's Shackle for? Well, Shackle actually, if you look at the, the um, spec, it's, boy, it's got 20 or 30 use cases that it's designed to accomplish. The central one, the one that I think is most central and the reason it came into existence in the first place is to, to enable separation between what's actually going on in the subject matter. So what is true in any industry, any financial industry that's trying to manage risk? What is true in any electrical products company um, that sells electrical products? Um, but you might have a particular voltage regulator that in actual fact has 27 characteristics that are important for somebody some of the time, but any particular application only needs a subset. So OWL says, here's what's actually going on in reality. Tackle says, here's what you care about in this particular application. Okay, so this way you can have one single OWL ontology be the basis for many different triple stores which drive many different applications by using different sets of shackle constraints. So one application uses, you know, 16 of those 27, the other application uses nine of those 27, and only five of them overlap. Um, so this separation makes it possible to do things um, in a good um, modular way. Um, now, what's interesting about OWL and Shackle, if you've ever started with an ontology in OWL and you see the restrictions, and then you start building some Shackle, you notice quite quickly, well, gosh, an all restriction kind of has an echo in shackle. It looks kind of the same. It almost seems like, well, this is kind of redundant. Maybe I don't actually need the all at all, and I can just build out ontologies, in effect, data, data models, data schema, whatever, only using shackle. So there's more than one person I've come across who, who advocates this. These are smart, knowledgeable, experienced people. But we don't think that's a good idea, and here's why. Um, yes, it can make it can work for point solutions, and it might actually be faster to, to build out one point solution. Don't brother with the all, just build the shackle, and off you go. However, what happens when you do this is you blur the distinction between what's going on in the real world, which doesn't change, versus what's going on in an application, which can change frequently. Um, so we like to create one piece that's stable, and we can manage that independently from managing the things that change all the time, and it just makes life a lot easier. If you only use Shackle, then you really don't even have an ontology. Uh, you, if you have built three different applications all using electrical products, then you can have three different Shackles, Shackle specs, and there's going to have a tremendous amount of overlap, but you can't really make use of that. And um, so in actual fact, that undermines the core purpose, one of the core purposes of an ontology, which is to have a reusable schema, a reusable model of reality, a reusable model of some subject that you can make use of. Um, and so if you do this, hey, we don't need all, we'll just use Shackle, then I think you're going to end up paving the cow paths with semantic silos. Um, another question that comes up is, do you even want a schema? Some people say, no, 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 who needs a schema? Um, one of the major graph vendors says, you can't have one. If you use our graph tool, you can't have a schema. And they think that's an advantage by saying you don't need one, but they go further. It's not just a question of you don't need one. They, they, the, the language doesn't even support it. The tool doesn't support it. Um, fortunately, that's not pervasive, but you do see that from time to time. Um, again, you can build systems this way. If you don't have a schema, you can build out systems, just build your triples, whatever. But now you can't express what things mean. And if you, know, if you don't know what something means, then you can't reuse it. Um, so there you go. Um, and then you end up with more silos. 
so our position on schema is you always should have one. And sometimes we, we sometimes just move quickly and don't put the ontology in right away, but we, we never go too far down that road because then things get out of control pretty quickly. And especially if there's multiple people working on a project and all you have is in your scripts that make triples, that's the only place the so-called ontology exists. It's not a good way to proceed. Um, now there's one final thing that I'll talk about that is very, very important as we move away from simply building ontologies that are fun to have and look, we can publish a paper, here's an ontology for this, here's an ontology for that, but nobody's actually using it. Well, now people are using it um, and there's things that happen that need to be updated. So with the traditional relational database driven applications, you don't even really, in practice, you don't really have an option to update the schema. Um, and if you do say, I need an extra field, um, then it could take months to add a single extra field to a, a complex application. Um, and this is one of the major drivers for rigidity. Now in semantic technology, you actually can do this, but again, there's no free lunch. It does a fair amount of work. And what does that work look like? Well, you have to inform all the downstream users of what changed, and then they need to bring things up to date. So what does that look like in practice? So we've generating, a, we're, we're having a lot of experience with this because we're starting to work again with companies, multiple applications, multiple um, ontologies and sub-ontologies across organizations coordinating all this. So it's quite important. Um, so what first, what has to happen? So you, you make some changes to the ontology and then you're, all your semantic technology specialists and engineers and whatnot downstream, first they have to update all their ontologies. So if you, if you create it, or they have to import the ontology that changed, now as a new version. Now, if you're generating triples from a database, um, and maybe what we're happening, what we're doing now is we have things in production, so real world changes, and then every day or every month or every week, depending on how fast things change, we regenerate the triples. Well, if you change the ontology, you have a new URI for something, or you refactor things in a certain way, you have to change the, the scripts or the charcoal for generating the triples. Then you have to recreate the triples again, then you have to load them all again. And if there's production systems going on, you have to have the usual sorts of testing suites. So we use a combination of Sparkle queries for QA and also Shackle to make sure you run all the Shackle on your standard examples to make sure you get the right results. And then you have to make sure that the applications that use the ontology, the Sparkle queries that are the core of making an application go, they need to change. Um, so there's really quite a lot of work to be done. And you can automate a lot of that, um, but it's, some of it's manual effort. Okay, so we're, we're nearing the end here. We've got 20 minutes for questions and quick few conclusions. Um, semantic technology is going mainstream. Um, it's certainly not the case that 90% of all technology and applications is semantic, it's probably 5% or even 3% or 1%, who knows. But 1% of a vast, massive amount of industry is still pretty significant. Um, so what you do is you drive applications from a knowledge graph, which is always backed by ontology. Um, and our, the way we view things um, instead of a relation database. Um, and then the enterprise ontology is extremely important. It silences that siren call to make more silos, even though you're using semantic technology. Um, we also um, warn against using Shackle instead of all. You can do that, but again, you're just gonna build point solutions and undermine reuse, which is the whole point of having an ontology. And the ontology evolution pipeline does require some care. So there you have it. I'd be very happy to entertain uh, questions. Now I'm not tracking the chat. So if someone wants to field questions for me or suggest questions in my direction, or I don't know how this works, but I'm happy to entertain questions. Hi, Michael. This is Ira Baxter with Semantic Designs. I love this talk. Thank <laughs> this you. It's great. Okay, I looked. I looked at uh, at, at uh, the knowledge, knowledge triples, knowledge graphs. Okay, when so it first came out with this book back in the '80s, and then very uh -huh. carefully haven't used them for 20 years, but I've been eyeing them with interest <laughs> for a long time. Okay. Right. Um, I happen to be, first of all, my company name is interesting. The company name is Semantic Designs, not Semantic Arts. <laughs> oh, interesting. Appreciate that. You're, you're, I'm looking at your name. It's I.D. Baxter. 
uh, Ira Baxter, right? Okay. Ira Baxter. Right. Okay. What we what we do is is uh, automated uh, modifications of large scale software systems. Okay. Largely okay. migrations from COBOL to Java. That's the easy thing to understand. Oh okay. uh, yeah. <clears throat> more, more complicated variations are reverse engineering from low level code back to high level models, so that you can forward engineer to a new model from there. Yep. Okay. And that kind of gets you into the knowledge graph business, right? Okay, yeah. we don't do that in a formal way. We do it in kind of an informal way, and I have always, that's always made me crazy. <laughs> yeah. like, you know what we're saying. So I'll comment here. One of the wonderful things about Schema is they organize your world, okay, so that you can use that to help think about what's going to happen, by right? organizing. Yep. That's the great thing. The bad thing about Schema is, okay, is there a bad model of the world? They're always wrong. Okay, which means you have to change them. And I, I appreciate the fact that your talk said, yes, we have to change them. And here's an evolutionary technique for doing all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. There's an interesting question of whether you can, and I've, th I've thought about this uh, to some extent. Okay, can you take schema deltas and use them to automate the generation of, of uh, reorganizing the data? I think if you could do that, that would allow the evolution of these things to be a lot more straightforward. It's the same thing that stops people from changing relational database schemas. Okay. They, if they touch the schema, all the applications break. Right, and so yes. what you want to do is propagate the delta from the schema into the applications. You want to automate that. And my PhD thesis was on this topic. You might want to go look. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the answer to the question is, I believe you can. We're starting to do that type of thing. Here's a simple um, way you could do. Here's a here's an example of how you could do that in a, for a simplistic case. Um, let's say you just change an IRI. Maybe it was just something like a typo. You misspelled something. So now you change the IRI. Now, if you have your, all the Sparkle queries that drive the application, if you have those Sparkle queries themselves represented um, as triples, um, like something like spin, or if you have, then you can, you can run code over all the Sparkle queries and change those IRIs. You can also have um, tracking technology that says what change affects what other things. So there's a lot of scope for automation we're starting to do some of it. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question is yes, but it's for us anyway, it's early days. Others may be more, more ahead of the game. I'd, I'd love to chat with you offline, okay, at some point. Yeah, why don't we do that? Send me an email. I think you, my email should be available out there. I'll do that. <clears throat> thank you. Wonderful talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mike Bennett has his hand up. Oh, Mike, hey. Hi, Michael. Um, I guess you're not monitoring the, the chat and Ira who just spoke wasn't aware there is a chat so Ira there's a whole place where we have a to and fro and it's not the zoom chat it's a separate chat room that you'll find in the invitation email where we yeah, back I saw up. that but I didn't open it up I haven't done yeah, it. you needed to open that up um oh, sorry so, for violating the protocol I didn't know it no happened. not at all you wouldn't know but um that's what I'm telling you uh <laughs> it's all very casual here but we just uh you know like to remember to remind people that sometimes because it's quite a valuable resource anyway yep. that wasn't my question so michael i have a meta question so oh yes kind of, so kindly ignore the question and wait for the meta question so the sure. the question you're to ignore is that in several places you treat a jurisdiction and country as if they're the same concept the meta question is this i'm going to assume that you guys are experienced ontologists, so you weren't simply reacting to the words that a customer put in front of you. That's right. You're perfectly aware that jurisdiction and country are entirely distinct concepts, one legal and they one are. three with locations. So you must have decided to conflate those, which I would do for a standalone application. But here you're talking about enterprise ontologies. So even if for the first two or three iterations, you haven't seen a use case or a competency question that required that distinction, it still looks to me like a dangerous kind of process to take to be conflating things just because the first few examples require it. And doesn't that result in you having to have breaking changes instead of simply additive changes? Because Al manages additive changes extremely well if you have segregated the core concepts between, say, legal and locations in the first place. So uh, it's kind of partly a harsh criticism and partly a, a question for you. To <laughs> That's okay. Hey, well, that is a good question. And what happens in reality is, I, I'm glad you pointed out that looking at the word isn't really the important thing. Um, and so when we see a term like jurisdiction, we know full well, especially because we work with um, legal companies, and there's like 35 page 
pages on papers going into the idea of the nuance of jurisdiction. There's lots of different meanings of that word. So we say to the client, well, when you use that term jurisdiction, what do you actually mean here? And they say, oh, we just mean the country. I'm like, oh, okay. And then we, we, uh, we might believe them right away if we already have had long conversations with them. Or we would say, well, really? I don't know if that's true. And then we'll poke and dive a bit deeper. And then we'll realize, well, actually, yeah, that's really what they really do mean. They really just mean the country. But they're using the term jurisdiction because that's how they think about it. So that being the case, we wouldn't get into the problem that you're you're realizing. If, if indeed we needed to model the distinction of jurisdiction in, in more of its nuance. So jurisdiction can be a region, a political, geopolitical entity. It can also be a subject matter, like a judge has jurisdiction over drugs and alcohol, but not over... Well, well, a jurisdiction can correspond yeah. to a region. So if you take the ISO uh, system, it doesn't distinguish between a region like Delaware and a region like Yorkshire, whereas Delaware is or has a jurisdiction and Yorkshire does not. So you can start to ask um, questions of the client that tease out these distinctions. Because don't forget, a lot of clients are using what is this effectively synecdoche. They're often using one word to refer to something else or a whole or a part or something. And they jurisdiction are. is a good example of where clients are using the word synecdochally. So you need to ask them things like, would this apply to Delaware? Would this apply to, you know, um, Mato Grosso? Or would it actually only apply to all of the United States? Exactly. One of the common Thanks things that we Brazil. struggle with. Yeah, no, that's true. And one of the common questions we always ask ourselves is when, it comes, when they talk about regions like that, we wonder if they yeah. really care about the geopolitical entity or do they care about the area? So if exactly. they care about rainfall, then they really don't care about the geopolitical area. Exactly. Um, so... So we always ask the client uh, what distinctions matter, and then we model appropriately. Uh, I think the, the problem, thank you, Michael. Let's leave time for some other questions. Uh, shall I go next, Kenneth? Sorry, I was muted. Okay, Todd, go ahead. Hi, Michael. I have two and a half, maybe, like, maybe two, two and a half questions for you. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe three. I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Um, based on what you've just told us today, should we presume that semantic arts has a definition of knowledge graph that you operate with? <laughs> uh, because That's of course, yeah, Not per se, we just build triple stores and, and if, they're, if it's backed by an ontology, which is knowledge about a subject area, we call it a knowledge graph. We don't get in, we don't worry too much about any nuance or distinction. You can ask me a specific question, is it this or is it that? And I can answer it, but we don't get into worrying about the details of what that means. But your modus operandi requires some sort of ontology behind the scenes to underpin your work, right? We always use the ontology as a schema for the knowledge graph, for the triple store. Yeah. So sort of um, by default, you have a definition of knowledge graph, which you may not make explicit. <laughs> In that, there's in effect, a yeah. When we talk about knowledge graph, that's fair enough. And when okay. we talk about knowledge graph, what we're talking about is an ontology set of triples and data triples and maybe taxonomy yeah. triples all lumped together in a triple store. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the goals of this particular summit was to try to promote a consistent definition, or at least an understanding of what a knowledge graph should be. So that's why I was asking that question. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, sure. Next question. You talked about the impact of making a change to an ontology. So there's yeah. sort of two questions I have, or one and a half. Um, what sort of changes did you have in mind? Are you, you mentioned one particular situation where there's a typo in the IRI and you, know, you have to correct that. But what if, are you talking about major changes to your upper ontology? Now, for people that don't know, Semantic Arts has their own upper ontology called GIST, GIST however, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and I know you guys change that, but it's not that often. So when you talk about ontology changes, are you talking about these significant uh, changes that might affect everything under the sun or just uh, minor inclusions of new classes or new distinctions that have to be made? Well, that's a good question. Of course, the answer is there's all levels of change. The easy ones are pretty small and minimal impact. And every so often, Fortunately, pretty rarely, you, you really are driven to make a change that has broader impact. 
Um, so there was an interesting example, one of our recent clients. Um, so they sell information about commodities markets and one of the things they sell is what are the prices for, you know, selling aluminum in Australia or something like that, or a particular grade of aluminum. So every commodity has different grades. It has, you know, high quality, low quality, medium quality, and they measure that with very specific measures. Um, so we modeled that out in a certain way and it's okay, these are essentially measures. Um, and then we set that aside and we worked with a different part of the organization coordinating as we do. And they were interested in analytics, so not so much what are the prices, but they're interested in analytics. Um, and then we started modeling that out and I won't go into the details, but I suddenly realized, well, wait a minute. In one case, we modeled it in a certain way. In another case, we modeled it in another way. And we realized that actually they're the same thing. And I thought, but well, we need to marry those. So I sat back, scratched my head, drew a few pictures, and came up with a change that at one level is kind of fundamental to how everything is structured. But on the other hand, it turned out to be a relatively minor impact. So the actual amount of things you have to do differently are pretty small. A few changes to the charcoal um, and a few changes to sparkle queries downstream. So there's every degree of, of um, you know, difference that there's every all kinds of differences some have minor impact some have major impact. right we, we really work hard to avoid the ones with major impact they have to have a really really strong then and, and then now the uh, point 0.5 question i have is in in, <laughs> in well it's, it's a follow-on if you like um, yeah, no that's good i like it it's a good idea in, in the depend in the uh, one of your slides you talked about the impacts of making those changes and you made reference to the fact that you may have to rebuild all your triples but yeah. isn't doesn't it depend on the particular triple store that you are using in that some triple stores um, don't materialize changes until queries are made? Well, no, for example, again, taking a triple example, let's say you, you had a typo, you misspelled right. uh, your country or something, and it was everywhere and you're like, oh, geez, that was stupid. Oh. So then you just rerun the triples, you reload everything. That's pretty straightforward. So that, that doesn't make any difference what triple store technology is under. Right, but if you had to add a new class, for instance, or you had you added you added a new subclass uh, to uh, account for additional distinctions that were, were were required. Well, if you did okay, if you added a new subclass, and then let's say you had two kinds of a something. Let's say you have an additional grade of aluminum, and you want to have two subclasses for each. Right. Each. Um, then all the instances of one would, have, if you wanted to, if you only had things being part of a, instances of a single class, and then you wanted to go through and break those all up, then you'd have to do a separate, um, no. quite, the separate exercise of breaking up all those instances. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Well, yeah, you're, you're getting to it. It's, it's a complicated okay. question because there's so many dependencies involved. I wouldn't expect a straightforward answer. If you, there was one, I would yeah. question your sanity. <laughs> but the short answer is it doesn't really depend very much on the, the knowledge, the triple store technology. Now, there is one caveat. I don't, it's not a caveat, but there's one thing I should call attention to. Some of the triple store technology and graph, te graph database technology more generally is getting really smart about versioning. So maybe there's a version which had the misspelling um, with two N's in the word country. And now that we, we corrected that, but maybe there's some application somewhere that didn't get updated right um mm -hmm. so some of the some of the, the newer technologies they can do time travel you can go back and say well what was the graph state of the graph what were the triples at this moment in time versus some other moment in time? so that could impact on your question but i just thought i'd mention um, uh, please indulge me with one more question um <laughs> sure I, well you know, yeah, I'm sorry, up because... to ken up to ken to say if he wants any questions oh us. ken's very generous um <laughs> You talked about the some of the triple some of the graph uh, vendors that don't require any sort of schema or whatever, and the question I have has to do with the expectation of the interpretations of what's represented. So my question is: To what extent are you relying on the natural language terms, that is, whichever natural language (English, French, German), uh, as opposed to uh, formal constraints on the interpretation? That's a great question. And it, comes, it, it relates back a little bit to what Mike um, Bennett was saying. So if you use this 
graph technology, it doesn't allow you to have a schema and you just use the word jurisdiction in there. And you have nothing whatever to go on except for the word jurisdiction. Now in OWL, you have the ability to create restrictions and more formal documentation, but ultimately everything bottoms out in, in natural language and what your understanding of the things down below are. So we can say geopolitical entity um, and you can write all the actions you want, um, but there's still some scope for ambiguity. So we try to iron out that last bit of ambiguity by having well-crafted natural language definitions. So for example, if Mike Bennett came along and he saw somebody have a class called jurisdiction, he'd say, whoa, I don't know about these guys. Jurisdiction means 16 different things. What do these guys think it means? And then he would very rightly look carefully um, and say, oh, okay, they really just mean country. And then he might scratch his head and say, all right, for this context, that actually makes sense. And maybe they didn't need all these other 16 things. However, that's because we would have modeled out, hey, we wouldn't probably have used the word jurisdiction. We would have changed it to what it really means. Um, but if you used a technology for knowledge graphs, which didn't allow you to express the meaning of that nature, you'd, you'd kind of be stuck and then you'd have the problem that you're referring to. Thank you, Mike. Have fun wherever you You're are. I, I yield the uh, floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, John has his hand up. Okay. Uh, I was concerned about some of the issues uh, which I had hoped that uh, um, could have been solved now, especially since uh, these are pe the, the people that are talking now have been working on them uh, for a long time, and we have all been discussing these things for years and years. And that is, uh, this whole stuff was designed, was being done in the 1960s and 70s with the uh, uh, multiple kinds of uh, databases. And uh, the fact that the uh, this has been scaled up uh, millions or billions of times, doesn't uh, change the issues. The issues of semantics that were uh, alive and well in the 1960s are still there. And uh, uh, the basic issue is that you need some sort of solid kind of version of logic. You also need to deal with the words that people use when they're talking. And you also need uh, some solid conventions about terminology. Now, IRIs are the latest buzzword for uh, uh, solid uh, l uh, labeling things, and I'm perfectly happy to accept IRIs, but the fact is that people who talk never talk in IRIs, and you always have to relate their words to the IRIs, and the knowledge graphs were designed by Google as a version of the uh, semantic networks that had been around for the past 50 years, and they were saying that, well, uh, what we want to do is to relate the kinds of words that people use when they're asking a query or a search uh, a request and relate them to uh, Google had developed schema.org as, <clears throat> as an ontology. And we want to relate the words of their words to the words in schema.org and relate them to the words in the uh, uh, Wikipedia and DBpedia and all those things. And so they had developed these knowledge graphs as very simplified kind of um, semantic networks in which the words that occur in the semantic in the knowledge graph are not IRIs. They are ordinary words that people use when they're talking to one another. And they develop technology for relating those to various kinds of uh, things that are out there on the uh, on the web. And so the IRIs are these low level kinds of things that only the computer knows. And somehow you have to relate these to one another. And then you have to relate uh, these uh, these semantic kinds of things to the applications that had been developed over the uh, past um, hundred years or so. Uh, there are uh, terminologies that can't go back to the early uh, 20th century, and there are terms that uh, every business has been using for many, many years. And there are these ontologies that are embedded in these legacy systems. And legacy systems are the primary semantic systems that we have to deal with. And every legacy system has a semantics that you have to understand in order to relate it to any new semantics. And so we all have to deal with semantics to semantics to semantics to semantics. And that's the whole problem of interoperability. And IRIs, 
the only thing that an IRI does for you is to give you a solid pin uh, a pinhole to uh, stick things uh, to stick things with, so that you can relate lots of things that after you have resolved, you can relate them to the same point. But there's a huge amount of semantics that has to deal with ordinary language, and then has to deal with every version of every application that anybody has ever developed over the past 50 years. And any business that's been around for more than a few years has got decades and decades of stuff that have uh, that ha uh, they have to resemble and any business that has any more than about a half dozen people is going to have di different departments for their uh, sales different departments for management engineering and um, uh, maintenance and research and all those different departments have different databases and different ways of storing things and they all have to be interrelated and you have to interrelate your things with all of your uh, suppliers and with all your customers and this is an immense problem and these issues were discussed in terms of this conceptual schema of the 1970s of the ANSI spark uh, schema of 1978 that was published by ANSI and then there was an ISO work on conceptual schema in 1987 and then there was another uh, ISO work that uh, developed a, uh, uh, a, a technical report in 1999 but that was completely ignored because by that time the uh, semantic web became the new uh, semantic system and the thing is that People aren't addressing the question of interoperability now, and they're not addressing the question of how do you write lang language to everything else. And I would say that Google at least has done that, and they developed these very simple knowledge graphs for relating them, and nobody is talking about that. And I find that it so frustrating. <laughs> okay, that's my rant for the day. First of all, the majority of what you said, I, I understood and I agreed with. Um, the, the long and the short of it, one major thread of what you said, if I understood correctly, is that a lot of this has been around for a very long time, and to some extent, what's the big deal, what's new? Um, and so, yes, I would agree, almost all of this stuff has been around from the 60s, 70s, 80s, all is just a rehash of classic, which is a rehash of KL1, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, um, I would say the following, it's having been working in industry for quite a long time, trying to make this stuff go in production systems. The fact that we have a set of standards now is quite important. Companies would like to have standards, so that makes it possible. Even, even like 10 years ago, we couldn't say, you know, these systems will scale up. We couldn't with confidence, hand to heart, say, we can build out a, a system that will scale. Uh, as far as the IRIs go, Google does have, well, schema.org, so schema.org for, you know, smartphone, there's probably some schema or thing called smartphone. Those are in fact IRIs. They mint them, they have, they have a, a schema.org namespace. So those IRIs exist. Um, so I would just say that the technology maturity, the fact that there is a standard out there makes it possible for us to do things now with our clients that wasn't possible before. And all of what the rest of what you said is, is pretty much true. You know, there has been a logic underpinning all this stuff um, so I would say mostly I agree with you, but to clarify what's important about the technology base that makes it easier for us to go into clients and deliver stuff. Well, one thing that I keep mentioning is the uh, uh, DOL from the uh, domain and uh, the, o the OMG standard, which relates every one of the semantic network logics and the UML logics all to common logic and they've been extending this to a whole range of other things and I think that Dole is probably the uh, major foundation for doing all this kind of stuff and uh, uh, that ha is an OMG standard published in 19 uh, uh, no excuse me 2018 and uh, it has been uh, uh, out there and uh, people are still using things like uh, OWL and RDF as if these were some sort of big deals. And, but the point is that the semantics is totally independent of notation. OWL is just one rinky-dink little notation. And the idea of having different 
uh, different standards for different ones of parts of those things is irrelevant since translating from one of those notations to another can be done with systematic ways. The DOL standard establishes ways of translating one thing to another, and it's totally irrelevant whether you store things, whether you put use the same uh, triple store for storing your uh, ontology and your data, or you put it in some in relational data and some in uh, triple store, some in uh, any kind of representation you like, where you store it is totally irrelevant. That's the point lesson that was learned in the 1970s. The place you store the data is totally irrelevant. The notation you use for the data is totally irrelevant. And because translation from one to another is is so fast and so simple, it can be done so much better than humans can do it, that there's no reason why you have to have, uh, why you need to do, uh, why you can't just relate all of these things to one another if you have a systematic set of uh, logic to go with it. And uh, psych had a uh, far and away superior form to from OWL or anything else, and they had the notion of micro theories. So you can take multiple independently developed um, micro theories and relate them all to one another in a systematic way. And that was done in the 1990s. And people are well, still, still in I, such I, a primitive way. <laughs> I consider all this stuff just primitive semantics. Well, that's okay. You can consider it that way. And we're just helping our clients, and they seem to be happy with that. Yeah. Well, um, I, it's, I, I can't argue with true. anybody who's making a profit from their project. But the thing is that I, these are things that uh, are, I consider these solutions the part of the problem. They're not a long-term solution. The long-term solution is that you've got to be able to systematically relate anything to anything else. Psych has been doing that with their so software for the past 20, 30 years. And uh, well, people don't study it. That's good for them. Yeah, um, okay. Well, yes, but nobody else is studying it. I'm telling people, look, study what's done, and you'll be able to build, build on top of that. I've actually seen Psych. I've looked at it some of our clients. Um, it's, it, 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 from my perspective, it's vastly overcomplicated and unusable in practice. I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree that it can be made simpler. On the other hand, they have solved the problem, and now the next question is, how do you simplify it? And uh, But uh, the thing is, you have to look at the solution to say, yes, they have solved this problem. Now, how do I make it simpler for my client? And those, yeah, and, and again, I, I don't want to uh, complain about your your company because your company, I, I believe, is doing good work for what for the technology that's available. What I find so frustrating is that every little company is redoing the uh, reinventing the wheel a million times over. I actually realized I got a meeting that I'm supposed to be jumping. Yeah, on. we're we're running over. So um, yeah. thank you, everyone, for your. So we're going to um, have to adjourn. Invasion. So thanks, everyone. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, but. Uh, can, can. Thanks, Michael. Can, okay, you're welcome. Can you must allow Ivan.